guys ready to get in the word? So good. We're talking about how to control your soul. And, and, and this is week three. We've been talking about the renewing of the mind. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Paul, writing to the church at, at Thessalonica, he said this, he said, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. So God wants you sanctified wholly or completely. And then he explained this and he says, And I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants you, he, he really laid out the makeup of man. You are a spirit. You possess a soul which is comprised of your mind, your will, and your emotions. The soul is what we're talking about in this series because your soul is the decision-making process center of your life. And, and so whoever controls your soul will control your future. And so we want to make sure that your, you, the spirit man that you are, controls your soul because your spirit is submitted to the Holy Spirit. We call that the spirit-led life being led by the Holy Spirit. He leads your spirit, and then your spirit is directing your soul. So you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a physical body. This, the fact that you're living in this earth suit, this physical body, gives you a legal right to operate in the earth. So you're here for a very... This is, this is going to be the shortest span of time in anything that you're called to in your whole life, which is eternal. Man is an eternal spirit. Do you notice as your body ages, you don't really feel older? Now, your, your body might feel older, right? I mean, I, I, I can still dunk a basketball. It doesn't look pretty, and I have to lower the rim a couple feet, <laughs> right? But it's not like it used to be. When, I, I mean, now before I exercise, I have to do this weird thing called warming up. But your body, it's aging, but your spirit is being renewed day by day. This is why in, in, any, in, in the church, I'll just say in the church, we should have complete generational cohesion. In a church, you should see a 70-some-year-old man or woman ministering to a 20-some-year-old man or woman. Actually, that we need that because the younger generations, we need what the older generations can give us because somebody who's walked with the Lord and walked by faith and walked in the love of God and whatever, for all of her 40 or 50 years, they can tell you some things. You know, our church in Mount Pleasant that we came out of in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, we had a group of people that were married. They did all the marriage counseling. They had a combined total of over 600 years of marriage experience. Wow, right? So, but, but here's the other thing. The older needs the younger so that we stay young. Does that make sense? So, so it's real interesting. You can sit across a table from an 18-year-old, and now you'll notice the barrier is more generational because, you know, we're like, uh, you, they don't relate. Like, you'll say things, and they'll be like, well, what, what is that, right? You know, I, I, because they weren't living at that time. But when you talk about the word, do you notice there's no, you're on the same complete level? And the reason why is because their spirit is being renewed every day, so is yours. You know, the first thing all the younger people, if the rapture happened right now, the first thing they'd say to all of us that are a little older is, wow, you look really good. <laughs> people would be like, Pastor, I know that's you, but man, you know, seriously. I'll be like, yeah, that's me. Come on. 
you know, you used to tease me about being old. Let's go, to a, let's go see how you are on a basketball court right now, right? <laughs> so we're a three-part being. So here's the thing. Satan understands your makeup. He cannot speak to your spirit. He can't, he has no access to your spirit. But he does have access to your soul. What I mean by that is we know, we've talked about this so far, what he does is he will throw thoughts into your mind. Thought after thought after thought, and his thoughts are contrary to this. To get what his goal is, is he wants to get you to start taking these thoughts so that he could penetrate into your mind and now he can play mind games with you to where all of a sudden you don't really know who you are. You don't really know what you've been given. Sometimes you start doubting God's love for you, doubting his will for your life, all of this, and it's all for the purpose so that he can get you to enact your will and make a choice or decision that's contrary to the word. Because everything contrary to the word Everything produces only death. Now, it may feel good to your flesh for a season, but all roads with him lead to death. You know, um, a guy named Lester Summerall, just a great minister. He's went home to be with the Lord years and years ago. But um, when he went to the Philippines, when he got there on the front, now this was probably in the 50s, the 1950s. And when he got there, uh, on the front page of the major newspaper, I think, is, is Manila? Is that the big city in the Philippines? Okay. Uh, I believe it was in this paper, the major newspaper. Front page had a big story about this woman who they listed as being demon-possessed that was doing all, the, they had arrested her and was doing all these incredible feats of strength and all these crazy things. Five or six men would try to apprehend her. She would literally throw them off like they were flies. Just, just superhuman strength. They would try to bind her with anything, and she'd just break out of it. Sounds a lot like the madman of Gadara in the Bible, right? They, they finally got her in a, in a, in a thick cell, uh, and they lock, locked her in there. And, and all of a sudden, I mean, they, crazy things would happen. Like they would hear screams, she would start screaming, and they would go out and, and look at her behind the bars, and bite marks would appear on her flesh, and they would bleed. You know, this is, there's some doors open that we don't see here in America, that, that doors have been opened to some of this stuff, right? So anyway, Lester Summerall's there with a pastor, and uh, he's talking to this minister, and he's like, oh my gosh, he reads this article. He goes, man, he goes, somebody needs to go down there and get that lady free. <laughs> and the Lord speaks to his heart. He goes, that's why I brought you here. And so if you know Lester Summerall, his response was, I'm, Lord, I'm not talking about me. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I don't want to go down there, right? So anyway, the Lord started prompting him. I want you to go down there. I want you to set, get her set free. So he goes to this police station where she's incarcerated at. And he, you know, with the pastor and the pastor, they're telling these, these the officers, uh, you know, I probably threw a translator, hey, I need to go. Uh, I could go in there in that cell and just minister to her, get her set free and take care of your problem. Well, they're laughing. They're like, no, first of all, there's no way we're letting you in this cell. She would kill you. You know, like that. I mean, she's crazy and all this stuff. And Lester's like, no, 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 you know, please let me go in there because uh, I could get her set free. Well, while this conversation is happening, all of a sudden these blood-curdling screams. So they, it's her, back wherever the cells are. So all the officers start running back there. So Lester just goes with them. <laughs> and so they're all looking on the outside of this cell, and this lady's freaking out. And, and Lester's like, you know, if you'll just let me in there, I'll get her set free. And they're like, no, no, no. Well, after a couple minutes, they're, fine. they're like, fine, okay, if you want to go in, but we're going to watch this because this is going to be crazy. So they literally cracked the door open, shoved him in, and slammed the door shut because, you know, they were afraid of her getting out because she was lightning fast, all this stuff. And so Lester gets her, just, just 
commands a demon to come out of her. She gets set free, gets born again and everything. And afterwards was talking to her. Now, this was really interesting when I heard this. Because he asked her, he said, could this demonic force, I mean, she's speaking in a man's voice or not even a man's voice, all this stuff, it's a personality inside of her, right? Demon possession, it's, it's literally when a person's not born again, they, it's a possession where they take control. And uh, so she gets set free, she gets born again, and uh, he, he asks her a question, he goes, could that demonic force in your life make you do anything? And she, and she, to his surprise, said, oh, no. No, I had, I had to agree with it. The, she goes, man, there was a lot of stuff that, that he wanted me to do that I, that I wouldn't do. And, 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 and so, so, but it's a constant thing. That's how come people who are demon-possessed, it's even a progression. Because once they're possessed, they go deeper into these things. So doing things deceived into, but it had to be her. She had to enact her will. So now think about this. She's not born again. She's demon-possessed, and yet she was still in control. The enemy had to get her to say yes before she would do something. You know how, what was it, and again, I'll date myself, what was it, the, this is probably the 70s, the Flip Wilson, you know, the devil made me do it. Remember that statement? Well, no, the devil can't make you do anything. The devil can't even make people who don't know God do anything. He has to deceive them and get them to choose. If you'll notice in your life, you have never just been pushed into sin. Never. Never. You've always had to make a choice to sin. Guys, that should be some of the best news you've ever heard. Because when you talk about this stuff, you are in control. You, I, I was talking to Ryan before the service and he was watching on, on Copeland's broadcast, they had Dr. Caroline Leaf and she's a neuroscientist, studies the brain, and she was saying that the brain is literally wired to renew itself every 10 seconds. So this is why, this is why God tells you to never let his word depart out of your mouth. Because, because what happens is as the enemy, if we start entertaining his thoughts, we will stop taking thoughts captive. We'll stop renewing our mind every 10 seconds. We'll start renewing it slower and eventually not at all. And all of a sudden, we're thinking wrong. Right? So, so, this is, so if you look at that, you could even tell. So the Holy Spirit is going to always be leading me in a certain direction. He's going to always have me speaking the word of God. He's going to always be leading me. Whenever a thought is contrary to the word, if you, if you literally have, your, your, if you have put Jesus first in your life and his word is first, there will always be a scripture to say it is written to take a thought captive, always. It just, it's not mechanical, it just happens. So you don't, you don't try to focus on, okay, every 10 seconds. No, that's ridiculous. You just be you. This whole thing we're talking about is you being who you are in Christ. And the, and the Holy Spirit leads you, and he, it's just a fluid thing. It's in him that you live and move and have your being. But we're talking about this to really, we, I want you guys to know how, how this works. So in Romans chapter 7, in verse 22, we went over this about every, every time. This is the third week on this. It, it, real, it, it shows us in Romans chapter 7, Paul is talking about this conflict every Christian has. And he says, for I delight in the law of God, where? After the inward man. In other words, my spirit delights in God's word. Verse 23, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, Right? 
bring, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members, my flesh. So in Romans, in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, it says, For the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Well, where is the law of sin and death in me? It's in my flesh. It's in my members. The law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, is in my spirit man. And it causes me to delight in God's word. And, and because, see, in Romans chapter 7, he's like, who's going to deliver me from this? We find the answer, it's Jesus. And then in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that be in Christ Jesus, which we know that's defined later on in the chapter as if his spirit lives in you, you're in Christ. So now I've got the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus in my spirit man. And it makes me free from the law of sin and death that's in my flesh. But this law of sin and death that's in my flesh, notice it doesn't say it wars against my spirit. It can't. It wars against the law of my mind. Well, Romans 7, 23, what is the law of the mind? Remember, we define that. The law of the mind is, as you put the word of God in your spirit man, in your heart, it will literally cause your behavior to come in line with the word. So, so now, but I got to realize the conflict. The conflict is always going to be, the enemy's going to throw thoughts in my soulish realm, in my mind, to try to get my mind to side with the sin nature that's in my flesh. Because if it does, I will be a carnal Christian and I will walk out of my flesh and it can only, according to Galatians, produce what? Death. Isn't that crazy? So this is how the enemy walks about seeking whom he may devour. What does he do? He throws thoughts. He throws thoughts. He knows the thoughts that tripped up your great, 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 great grandfather or grandmother, right? The one underneath that, the one underneath that, your grandfather, your, your father. And he's going to, this is how he, he'll, he just, he's fishing. But although you can't stop thoughts from coming into your mind, you can take every one of them captive. Because why? Because the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus, when you got born again, it already made you free from the law of sin and death. It made you free from what your flesh can do. Now, how often will you have to deal with your flesh? Well, Paul said he had to beat his black and blue continually. So you'll, you only have to deal with your flesh while you're on this earth during this short season. Because Here's the thing, we have the first fruits of salvation, right? The first fruits of salvation. When I got saved, my spirit man was made, it was my old spirit man that was dead and separated is gone. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A brand new spirit was put in me, and now this spirit is free from the sin nature. It's spiritually alive. But that's the first fruits. How do I know I'm saved? The Holy Spirit inside of my spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. It's the first fruits. It's like the earnest, like if you're going to buy a house, you put down earnest money. Well, our earnest money is a brand new spirit with the Holy Spirit abiding in us. When we get to heaven, literally when you step out of your body, when you get to heaven, what's going to happen in the rapture those of us who are alive, when we're raptured up, our body will be changed into a glorified body without a sin nature, not subject to pain, not subject to sickness. It'll be eternal. For those that have died, when that happens, they will be raised first. How's God going to do that? That's not my deal. I have no idea. How does a person 2,000 years ago that died in the ocean and 50 different fish ate him. How is he going to bring all that back? I don't know, but he's going to. 
the body you have right now, you will have in all of eternity. The only difference, it will look really good. It's not, it won't be, it won't be age. You won't see age on it, right? So, so like your loved ones, if you've had loved ones pass from this earth, if you want to know what they look like, listen at my funeral, you know, I, if the Lord tarries, I, there's got to be a picture of me when I was probably 25 years old. Because that's the way I would look if you want to know what I look like in heaven. But only even better than that. And it's not subject to sin. I've got a glorified body. So what that means for me is I, don't, I won't have to deal with this sin nature anymore. But while I'm here, i got to deal with it. And here's the thing. I know that I've been made free from anything my flesh will try to make me do. I don't ever have to give in to it. Now, this is what happens. We, we term a carnal Christian, the world or people who don't want to come to church, they call that being a hypocrite. We all know what a hypocrite is, right? Because we've all been one. Have you ever said anything out of your mouth that really you don't really believe in your heart? Yeah. Unfortunately, we've done that, right? So, but, we, but now we're learning, so we don't have to do that. We could get free from all this stuff. But if you're carnal, the only difference between somebody who's born again and somebody who's not, a carnal Christian, when he operates out of his flesh and sins, what happens is his soulish realm senses that the spirit, his spirit is grieved, and that's the conviction of it. There's inner turmoil there. That's, that's see... The Holy Spirit's not going to convict a Christian of their sin because they already know. They're, you're convicting yourself when you do something wrong. Now, what happens, though, is you can sear your conscience to where you don't feel quite as bad, but you're always, as a Christian, going to have a measure of inner turmoil versus somebody who doesn't know God. If there's any turmoil in them if they're doing wrong, it's just because of the way they were raised Maybe, but there's not, there's not the same, because their spirit man is dead. It has, the, it has the same death, spiritual death nature in it. So there's not that degree of inner turmoil that a Christian has. I mean, am I, is this making sense? Have you ever been doing something that you know is not right? Have you ever been frustrated with that because you say, I'm trying to stop it, but I just can't? The only reason why a Christian would say that is because they've entertained the enemy's thoughts long enough to where those thoughts that they've taken into their mind have now produced a vain imagination, a picture within your mind of you living in a way that God doesn't want you to live. God has made a way for you. This is why the Bible says you, all, all things are possible to him who believes. Because you have, you have the ability as a spirit man to reprogram your life to think different so that your life changes. And this is what we're talking about here today. So important. See, we have this influence that's working in our flesh, and all that it's trying to do is it's trying to stop the word of God that's been sown in your heart from producing fruit in your life. That's, that's all it's trying to do. So we want to stop that. And in Romans chapter 12, in verse 1 and 2, which is what we're talking about, we mentioned this last week, Paul said this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, God won't do it, he won't make you do it, but you have to present your body a living and holy sacrifice to him. And the Bible says that, which is your reasonable service, many translations bring out the Greek, which literally means this is your spiritual worship. Do you want to worship God? You do it when you present your bodies to him. What do I mean by that? When you want to say something out of your mouth that you know the word, it's contrary to the word, but you just want to tell, tell somebody how you're feeling, right? That, that's, that's where you take that and you tell yourself no. I'll tell you, if you're married, your house can either, either become an environment 
where life is built to equip you in life, or your house can be built into an environment that literally gets your tongue undisciplined. Because husbands and wives, will, they will just, they will talk. And they talk all about it, how they're treated wrong at work and how this and that. And, and, and pretty soon they don't realize, but then when they get into their life, they start talking to other people about this. And it gives the enemy access. So we got to be real careful with this. It says here, and do not be conformed, or and be not conformed to this world, which tells me that a Christian can be pressed into the mold and look just like somebody who doesn't know God. But it says, but be transformed, be changed, be transfigured. How? By the renewing or the renovation of your mind that you may prove. This, this word prove literally means to see, to discern, to know. And it literally at a foundation means to determine by experience what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Not three wills for God, of God, one will. Three adjectives that explain one will. God's will for your life is good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect. But in order for you to even know and be able to walk out his will for your life, you're going to have to renew your mind. So this is why this is so, so important. You change into a whole new person as you change the way you think. Does this make sense? I, I hope as we're going through this, if you'll notice in our church, I teach on this from time to time because we have to keep this before us. Lately, the Lord has been taught, we've been talking, it doesn't matter what I'm preaching on, I'm talking about this. Because God wants, he wants to position you so that you can start walking in a manner that you, I mean, it's what you're called to do. You're in full-time ministry, whether you realize it or not. You are, you are literally, there's a call on your life. You've been ordained by God. You're here for a purpose. So we have to make right decisions because to control your soul, you have to think right. You have to make right decisions. Today, you'll be tested on this material. You're going to have thoughts coming from the enemy. And you're going to have to decide what you do with them. Right? But if you want to change, if you want this year to be different, you're going to have to change the way you think. Does that make sense? But here's the cool thing. God won't do it for you. The Holy Spirit won't do it for you. But he'll do it with you. If you're willing and obedient, he'll strengthen you. He'll get, he'll get the information you need over to you somehow. He'll bring people in your life. And, and pretty soon, you'll be able to filter out a lot of the death. It's like walking into a new room. It's wonderful. All of a sudden, you get hit by something, and you're looking at it going, man, that would six months ago, that would have really bothered me. But it's not bothering me as much now. For you married couples... Not, you know, there, there's some here that are not quite married yet. This is probably not true for you. But for you married couples, your wife and your husband will get more attractive. Right? Those who are not quite married yet, we don't even have to talk. Oh, she's the most beautiful thing. You know, it's like this. Why do we do pre-marriage counseling? I have no idea. Nobody remembers anything you say. It's just, I just want to get married, you know? It's hilarious. It's a wonderful thing. But... Here's what, as you walk with God, he'll keep your marriage fresh for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years. To where all of a sudden, you know, to everybody else, your wife or your husband might look older. But to you, you're like, wow, you're prettier than you were when you were 22 years old. It's the way it is with God. It's amazing. So you got to make right decisions. You're in control you're going to have to make decisions. Am I going to believe the devil's lies or am I going to believe what God says about me? And he has a right. He knows you. He knows you. So let me go real quick and talk about the mind. Let, let's talk about the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions. Decision-making is what your soul exists to do. Your soul is what makes decisions 
that cause you to act out by your will and do something. Intellectually, what happens is you look at things through your five physical senses and you evaluate them. Then, that's your mind. Then, and you'll reason and you'll look at everything. But with your mind, you do that and then you interact that with your emotions, how you feel about it. Because everything that you look at will give you an emotional response, right? See, a lot of people think they get in fear just because something, something comes up in their life and instantly their flesh is kind of freaking out. No, and the enemy will tell you, oh, you're in fear. You're not in faith. No, have you ever done this? I remember when I, um, I was really stupid a few years ago and almost died uh, out in California in the ocean. And, uh, you know, I, I got out there. It was, it was, they had these erratic waves and they were like 15 feet or more and I'm sitting there and I keep looking at these waves thinking, oh, that looks so cool. I remember, you know, so, so here as a 50-some-year-old man who's not in shape, who never was a good swimmer before anyway, but when you're in really good shape, you could just kind of hang and let it all pass. But uh, I get out there and instantly I'm in trouble. My legs are cramping up and it was, it was the craziest thing. I'm so, I'm so glad Satan did this because it really exposed the spirit of fear. It was like a blanket of fear just came over me. And instantly, instantly in my mind, you're going to die today. What's going to happen to your wife and your family and your church, the church and all this other stuff? And, and I literally started laughing because I'm like, I realize because I walk with the Lord, I didn't say I'm going to die. The voice was very clear, you're going to die. So I responded, I am not dying today. I don't care if two angels have to grab me because I'm a little bigger guy, and they have to walk me out of here. I don't care if I have to walk on the water. I am not dying today. And literally, I felt, I mean, it was fear all over me. And I, was, I just felt it lift off. And there was this, there, the only smart thing I did, I was by this, these two guys. One guy was a little older than the other one. It was a father or son, I learned later. So I, I kind of, I said, hey, I go, can you guys help me? I can't, I can't get back in. And so instantly, man, you know, in California, you just know, they're there. And uh, the son would, like at a certain point, the, the father stayed with me. He stayed a little bit away from me because, you know, you could, he knew what he was doing because when people get in fear, they grab people and can take them down with. So he would stay right beside me and he's going, okay, we're about 60 feet away. And then, okay, let's go under this wave. And we'd, we'd go under the water, come back up. Okay, how are you doing? Good. You know, and then, then when there was a little break, his son would go, okay, stick your arm out and he, he'd grab my arm and he'd pull me in and so they got me in I was really embarrassed you know and but I told him I said guys you guys saved my life and 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 the guy told me he goes you know the guy he was he was probably 10 years younger than me but he goes you know I grew up in South Laguna I almost died a month ago and he says he goes if you'll notice everybody in the water today has fins and you don't and I'm like oh wow so, so it was real interesting, but the spirit of fear, it's external, guys. And, and it just like lifted off, and I was at peace. Now, my, I was wiped out. I was, you know, physically, I mean, I could feel, I couldn't really bend my leg much because I knew it would cramp up even more. I was, I was tired and, and all this stuff. I wasn't feeling good, but I was not at fear. I mean, I, was, I just wasn't at fear. Well, this is how this whole thing works. What happens is your mind, it looks at things and what you're in, your circumstances, it'll tell you how you feel about it, all this stuff, or your mind will tell you what's going on and then your emotions will respond and mix in with it and tell you how you feel about it, right? And then what will happen is now these two interact and then all of a sudden, as they interact, uh, you, you'll get a desire come up. And now, what you do based on that desire is you'll make a choice or a decision. You'll enact your will and then do it. 
So this is why Satan likes to build. If, see, if you take wrong thoughts long enough, you'll t- as you talk about wrong thoughts, see, your mind, it, it, it's built by mental imagery. If I say a red truck, you're not seeing the words in your mind, R-E-D, right? You're not seeing red truck written out. Down on the inside of you, you're, you're seeing this red truck. It's, it, you see an image. Well, this is what happens. As you, as you speak wrong thoughts, you, get, you start to build a vain imagination with your mouth. Pretty soon you start seeing your life a certain way. You will see yourself never being healed. You'll see your marriage never being healed. You'll see your finances never changing. Those are vain imaginations. And see, all behavior comes out of your imagination. And so then, when you start walking in that thought process and in that behavior, the enemy will continually create the same circumstances so you keep acting on it and acting on it. And pretty soon, it'll build a stronghold in your mind. This is why a life of thanksgiving and a life of worship is so important. Because there's something about you opening your spirit to God, whether you could sing or whether you can't, and you start worshiping according to the word of God out of your spirit, songs that are declaring who you are, it will, it will eradicate vain imaginations in your life. That anointing that comes when you hear the word of God, when it talks about it lifts a burden and destroys a yoke of bondage, study the word yoke. At the very core of that word, it means a lie. See, Satan doesn't build this demonic yoke that he just forces on you. He can't. He gets you to build it with your mouth. And all it is is it's a lie. Pretty soon you start saying you're worthless. Pretty soon you start saying it's never going to work out. Pretty soon, I mean, he could have you trying to destroy everything that's good in your life. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can change into an entirely different person by changing the way that you think. So your mind's evaluation interacts with your emotional response and it produces a desire. Then you enact your will and you make a choice or a decision. This is the way everything works. And if you're going down a wrong path, you can get right back on a right path today, right now. Isn't that good news? See, God, he wants you to train your soul to be subject to the Holy Spirit so that now you could walk and live a spirit-led life. See, so many Christians do not know what God's plan is for their life, but the reason why is because we're entertaining too many thoughts of the enemy. Because as you as you create an environment or allow the Holy Spirit to create an environment of his presence in your life, as you learn to walk with him, things become very, very clear. You won't know the whole plan, but you'll know your next step. And here's another thing. You'll be so courageous, sometimes you'll just think that might be your step, and you won't try to, you won't be all afraid. You'll just step out, and you'll start moving this way, and you'll be like, ah, eh, no, this just isn't it. And then another desire will be there, and, and oh, okay, this is it. You'll get real sensitive. You've heard me say this, I can't even tell you how many times. Being led by the Spirit of God is not a set of principles. It is a sensitivity that you maintain as you walk with the Lord. It's wonderful. What I'm talking about, guys, is the God of heaven is your Father. Now, if you haven't had a good father, I think it's hilarious, because as a pastor, I feel like a big dad. Which is hilarious because I have no paradigm growing up of a father. But I didn't need it because I have a paradigm that's wonderful. But, but see, here's the thing. You don't need, if your father abused you, listen, that's not the way God is. And don't worry about trying to, to make a decision about that. Just get in the word of God and you'll get to know him. He will prove himself to you. He'll prove himself to you so that you can trust him. So real quick, let's talk about the role of the mind. I'm trying to go faster, but I just can't. So just just work with me here because we're literally right on time, I believe. 
the role of your mind. God has ordained processes of your mind. It's the way he made your mind. Your mind has been made to perceive, to understand, to rationalize, and to draw logical conclusions about things. That's godly. God, notice in Romans 12, it doesn't say remove your mind, it says renew it, right? God doesn't want you to renew your, remove your mind. You need that, right? You don't want to become a Star Trek Christian. Boldly going where no man has gone before, right? Or God. Your current quality of life is a direct result, a direct result with what you've been doing with your mind. If you're allowing thoughts that are causing you to rationalize, understand, if you're, if you're entertaining the enemy's thoughts, you're, gonna, you're getting wrong information, so now your mind can actually be used against you because you'll form a vain imagination. But God wants the, your imagination to be filled with his word so that you imagine in your mind that all things are possible to you because you believe him. That your mind actually believes that when, you're, when, it's, when it's seeing things and your emotions are feeling like God's not with you, you're, you've renewed your mind, so now your mind's going, no, he's always with me. When you, when you choose wrong and you decide to, to walk in the sin nature in your flesh, when, you, when, you're, when you're still putting the word first, and, and again, you'll get to the point where you don't fall. But while this process is happening, what'll happen is it'll cause you to run to him when you mess up, not run away from him. Right? Remember when Adam and Eve fell, the first thing they did is they hid. They hid from God. They withdrew from God. And God doesn't want you to ever withdraw from him. Listen, you need him all the time. When you choose wrong, then you really need him. Because you got to get back. Because I'm telling you, the enemy's coming whenever you walk out of your flesh. You, you're opening a door to him. And the Lord loves to slam that door in his face. It's called repentance. It's called you change your mind. Right? So this is real, real good. Now, the role of emotions... Emotions are designed by God to give you momentum in the thing that God has called you to do. Emotions are very important. I am very emotional, very passionate about what God has called me to do on this earth. You know, as I, as I live in this world, I'm just very laser focused. Of, of, I have a lot of momentum coming from my emotions for me to, 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 for me to pastor and reach as many people and tell as many people as I possibly can that God is good and teach them how to grow up and all of these things. It gives me great momentum. But my emotions, your emotions, are not designed. They are never to lead you. And see, so many Christians are being led by their emotions. Oh, I just feel... I just feel like I'm supposed to do this. And you're looking at their life and you're just going, it's violating the word of God. You're making this decision to leave this place because you're uncomfortable here, not because God is leading you. If Jesus is your Lord and you're having a bad time at work, you can't just, don't, don't just sit here and go, well, I believe God's just leading me to leave. No, 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 no. Be real careful with that. But pastor, you don't understand, my boss has created an environment that's horrible. Yeah, and guess what? You have authority. So you go to your Lord and go, hey, can I have a transfer? And he might say no. But if he says no, listen, he's not going to have you live under the tyranny of somebody that can't stand you. So maybe he wants to move them or remove them out of the way. Or maybe he'll promote you over somewhere else in the company. Who knows? But, but here's the thing. Don't let your feeling or your emotions guide you in this. They are never to drive us. And, if, and, and I'm telling you, if your emotions are wrong, they'll try to drive you. I never feel driven by my emotions when they're right. I feel driven by my emotions in relation if they're wrong. 
and they're leading me to sin. Satan will use them to drive me to sin, right? Emotions, now this is a big one. Emotions are the result of what we have meditated on. I'm telling you, this is where the rubber meets the road right here. So many Christians, well, God said this to me. And all it is is they're trying to feel something. And you'll get all of that out of your life. You don't, you actually, you don't have to get it out of your life. The Holy Spirit will just get it out of your life if you'll work with Him. Your emotions right now are the byproduct on what you've been meditating on. Keep meditating on your problems and your emotions will drive you further into depression and anxiety and not being happy and out of peace. They will. If you're unhappy at work, you know the secret? Stop thinking about how you're unhappy at work. Well, how? see, God made your mind a really cool way. The way you stop thinking of, there's only one way to stop thinking about something. You know what it is? You start thinking about something else. So you replace what you're thinking about that's negative and contrary to the word, just replace it with the word. Right? Pretty soon, you're looking at this supervisor or this boss that's causing you all this trouble or this account that's causing you all this trouble. Pretty soon, you find yourself praying for this individual because the reality of it is they're not your enemy. So you can love them. And here's what's really cool is when you win them over because they can't stop you. Nothing can stop you. Why? Because God's with you. So if you'll line up with him, you're invincible. It's really cool. So your emotions are a result of what you've meditated on. What you consistently think about and the words that you speak will direct what you're feeling emotionally. You know, there's some people in this church that love me. I mean, love me. You know why? Because they talk about it. See, I've learned I could change the way I feel about everything. Do you know people that come against you that cause you trouble, do you know you could just love them just as much as that person that loves you with all their heart? Because the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. So as you just, as you meditate on the love of God, Father, I thank you. I pray this person who is despitefully using me right now. I just pray that you bless them. Man, when you first do that, your flesh will be like, what? <laughs> you know, no, no, your flesh will want to, Lord, just bless them with a beautiful Ferrari and may they drive that brand new Ferrari <laughs> off the end of a pier in shark-infested <laughs> waters, right? No, 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 it's not like that. It's not like that. It's, it's, it's really, you know, you just want them blessed. Because they're no longer your enemy. And that's when you'll start, you get your eye on the ball and you know this game that the enemy's playing and now you obey the, a big principle in the word of God and you never let the sun go down on your anger. That means you are angry. I am angry. I, I could feel it. I hate Satan. I hate everything about him. You're going to see me cheering when we see this guy cast into the lake of fire. I mean, I hate, if, and if, if you see, when I was a young man, I, I, uh, this, this happened to me, I was 18 years old. I was going through more things than I had ever gone through in my life. And what I would do, I would literally, I was living about 70 miles north of the border in Southern California, so I would drive. I would, even though I had a piece of junk car, I wouldn't drive it into Tijuana. I would just park it and walk, and I would go to this orphanage, and I would see what Satan has done to little kids. You know, little, this, I, I made a relationship with this little boy. And when I first met him, he just sat there. Just a little guy sat there. Had, had cigarette burn marks all over his body from his parents. His parents thought that was funny. They would just, they'd be drunk or high and just burn him. 
And I, every time I'd go down, boy, I'll tell you, by the time I'd leave, man, I, I, my life was better. You know, because I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, because you see, but I'm telling you, you start to hate Satan, and it's wonderful. You're like, well, Christians shouldn't hate. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, we need to hate evil. Now, we never hate people. As you, when you see things clearly, your worst enemy, your biggest, you have loved ones that are not treating you right. It, they're not your enemy. The enemy behind it is there. And you have authority and you can change it. Because here's the cool thing. The love of God that's shed abroad in your heart, it never fails. Never fails. Isn't that good news? God wants us to feel excitement. He wants us to feel enthusiasm. He wants us to feel determination upon what he's called us to. He wants you to be excited about what God's called you to do. And that's as you feed and meditate on right things, it'll, it'll straighten your emotions out. Isn't that cool? We must meditate on God's word regarding his plan and his purpose for our life. As we do that, we will start to sense and feel that emotional momentum moving us toward it. Do you know they say the average Christian hardly ever, ever shares their faith? And if you've never led anybody to the Lord, and you might say to yourself, I'm just not a talker, I don't know anything, I, I would challenge you, just start getting up every day and walk around and get those scriptures that talk about how you've been ordained to bear fruit. I've chosen you. You didn't chose me. And I've ordained you to bear fruit. Start, start speaking that over your life. Start thanking God for, and, and asking him to open doors to you to minister to people. And all of a sudden, you'll go from this timid person who's never spoken. All of a sudden, as you meditate on these things, you'll start to see and sense the plan of God that you are to reach people. Everybody wants to be in the ministry. You are. The only problem is you're not doing anything. So just go see, and, and you don't have to make it happen. You just make yourself available. Pretty soon, man, you're going to have, you'll probably have to start a Bible study at your house, and you'll be at Starbucks, and you'll, you know, what are you doing? You're going to be taking notes here to go teach them over there. And, and then when you come to church, all of a sudden you'll have this desire to get involved, to do, you know, whatever, but you won't have this, oh, I just have to teach. Oh, I just have to do this. Listen, if you're, if you're saying that, yuck. It's so, it's so much better than that. As you meditate on God's word, it, it, he'll, those, those emotions will be stirred and it will cause momentum. These emotions produce momentum in the direction of your God-given destiny. See, God has a plan for your life. This is why when you renew your mind, what happens now is your emotions come in line and they will start moving you. You'll just have this desire. I love being a pastor. I just love it. I thank God multiple times every day for the honor of being a pastor of one of his flocks in the earth. I just love that. But see, God, God wants that for you in everything he's called you to do. He wants you to love what he's called you to do in the earth. If you're working in a secular job, realize you're disguised as that, but you're a minister. Why are you, why are you here in Omaha? Why, are you, why do you live where you live? Why do you work where you work? Because God's got a plan for your life. But if you live for yourself, you won't see it. You won't sense it. So, how your soul works properly is this. A person whose soul is, is, this is proper soulish operation. This person constantly receives input from their spirit and their senses or their body. Their, their soul is, they're literally, they're constantly receiving stuff from their spirit because they're meditating in the word day and night. But they're also, they're also perceiving things through their body. This person then makes decisions that they believe are consistent 
with God's will. Why do they do that? Because they're meditating in his word. So all, every thought's going through the filter. See, the word is so powerful. When it gets in your heart, it'll be washing over your mind and it will affect everything in your life. As they meditate on the word of God, they will start making decisions that they believe are consistent with the will of God. And as they meditate on these decisions that they're making, what happens is as you meditate on them, you start to get emotionally stirred about them and it will create momentum to keep you going in that direction. So that whatever God's called you to do, listen, Satan's going to try to stop it. You know, I, I'd love to tell you that when you do this process, it's just all flowers. But no, you got some big enemies. There's going to be a lion that shows up. There's going to be a bear that shows up. You know, there's going to be a big giant called Goliath that shows up. There's going to be fiery furnaces and, and, and lion's dens. And Jesus says, but don't worry about all of that stuff because I've already overcome it all. And pretty soon, you're just walking in. Okay, yeah, whatever. I guess I go in the furnace. But guess what? There's not just me in there. You look in there, there's two. And this thing I know, I'm coming out, and you won't even be able to sell smoke on me. When I come out of this raging, raging ocean of, of, of the enemy trying to stop me, I come out, and you can't even tell I was ever in the water. Why? Because as I humble myself, and I cast all of my cares on him. What does he do? He exalts me. He lifts me above the, above the circumstances. How? Every time. So improper, or I should not say improper, I would say uncontrolled soulless operation is this. When your soul is out of control, this person, this person is constantly receiving input from their senses that they're evaluating. Notice they're not receiving things from their spirit and their senses. They're only receiving them from their senses because they're not in the word. God's word is not first, right? This person thinks and acts out of the natural arena because it's more dominant. This person starts reacting to what they see. See, notice they start reacting. They're no longer proactive, being led by the Spirit. Now they're all reactive. They're reacting on what they see and what they feel. And, and now they, they see this person and they're like, ugh. And then, you know, because or, or whatever. And they start reacting and it, it's inner turmoil constantly. This person does not control their thoughts and it will always lead them to death. I'll finish with this. The kingdom of darkness works hard to influence your decisions through your body. He uses your senses, your natural carnal reasoning, your circumstances. He'll use people. He's trying to influence your decisions. He doesn't care about you. He just wants to show the world that Jesus is not Lord of Lords. God, God works to influence you through your spirit by his word and by the Holy Spirit. He never drives you, he always leads you. Your soul is in the middle of this. It is the part of you where your spirit or your body can express themselves. Your soul is in the middle. Whatever your soul decides, it can decide to act out of your flesh or decide to act out of your spirit. He'll use people to provoke anger, to stir you up. He'll use smells that'll bring back memories of, of horrible things in your life or loss or whatever. He'll use all kinds of things, negative thoughts, to determine your destiny. And we say no, right? Realize this. This is why we talk a lot about faith. Faith is the power source. It's the power source to change your circumstances. You have to see you put corresponding action to your faith and power is released to change your circumstance. But if there's no corresponding action to your faith, then your faith will die unborn and nothing changes. So this is why your soul is so important. 
We're going to go into this more. I, I, I didn't get as far as I thought I would. Imagine that. But I, I, I think, we've, we're, I, think I, I sense that we're starting to see this. And I know you guys are probably, if you're sitting there today going, man, okay, I get it. My spirit does this, my soul does this. That, then that's good. That's where I want you. I hope by the end of this that you say, okay, I'm so thankful he's done talking about this. <laughs> I mean, I remember being at Rama. You know, we got a guy coming next Sunday. He was one of my favorite teachers at Rama. But I'd sit in his class and I'm like, Doug, you have gone over this every day. Can we please get into something new? And by the end of it, I'd realize, oh, I, I knew it, but now I know it. And I want you guys to know it, right?